On April 4, 1940, 11-year-old Chloe Davis of Los Angeles, California, awoke to the screams of her siblings as they were being murdered by their mother. Chloe was the eldest daughter of Barton and Lolita Davis. The family lived in a modest house at 1211 West 58th Place. Barton, a nearby grocery store manager, had gone to work earlier in the morning. Chloe's mother may have been awake all night, but she was in bed when Barton left. Chloe's two sisters, Daphne, aged 10, and Deborah, aged 7, as well as her little brother Marquis, aged 3, spelled like the Marquis de Sade, had not stirred until after Barton left for work. When Chloe awoke, the sights and sounds that greeted her were gruesome and horrifying. The bodies of her sisters and brother were strewn throughout the house where they lay dying, their heads bashed in from hammer blows. Little Marquis lay on the bloody kitchen floor, crying in pain. As soon as Lolita, dressed only in a flimsy and now blood-spattered nightgown, saw Chloe, she attacked her. She grabbed at Chloe and attempted to kill her too with the hammer, but Chloe parried and only received a superficial wound to her head and some scratches. Lolita tried to light Chloe's hair on fire with matches, but Chloe blew them out. Lolita had become deranged and suicidal, believing that she had the power to kill people with her mind and had done so in the past. She also believed that people were trying to kill her, that white slavers would kidnap her children, and that demons would torture them all. One may theoretically conclude the murders in her home that morning did not stem from rage toward her children, but from the mistaken belief that she was saving them from a worse fate. After the failed attack on Chloe's life subsided, Lolita sat down on a feather mattress with a pillow in the narrow hallway. Here she ordered Chloe to hammer her head so that she would die. Being in fear and wishing to help her end her suffering, Chloe obeyed and hit her over the head again and again after her mother laid back on the cushioning pillow and mattress. The effort made Chloe weak and she went to the kitchen to get water for herself and her mother once more. In the midst of this, the cries of the agonized three-year-old on the kitchen floor drew their attention. Lolita gave Chloe permission to put Marquis out of his misery, so with three hammer blows to his thin skull, he stopped crying. Then it was back to Lolita, but then the hammerhead broke off the handle. Chloe retrieved a small all-metal hammer, but it wasn't up to the job either. So Chloe tried again with the other hammer handle alone, but it seemed to be no use. Lolita, longing for death and out of her mind, set her own hair and nightgown on fire. Both burned off, but this, of course, did not kill her. She only had managed to make her sufferings worse. Drenched in her own blood and the blood splatter of three of her children, she made one final request to her firstborn, whom she raised to do as she was told, and that was to bring her a razor blade. Chloe left the hallway, returned with the razor blade, and handed it to her mother. Lolita Borklin Davis, aged 36, slashed her wrists, severed an artery, and bled to death in a mess of chicken feathers that had broken out of the mattress and that clung to her nude body like a spotted and macabre shroud. The small house was silent, though the smell of blood and smoke must have been overwhelming. Chloe knew she had to leave the house to call her dad, but not like that. She washed herself, got dressed, and left for a neighbor's house, locking the door behind her. Composed, she called her father and told him he'd better get home and nothing more. Barton left work, went inside the home, and fled back outside shrieking, crying, and pacing. The police and ambulance arrived. Chloe went back in and pointed out what happened. But inside, she never cried. In fact, she seemed more concerned about her father than herself. 
She was brought to the Los Angeles Police Hospital, and her wounds were bandaged. Almost as soon as she was brought in, the police informed the press that Chloe alone was responsible for four murders. She would go on to be questioned for hours. Though she stuck to her story, they didn't believe her since it appeared that four people were hammered to death and she alone curiously survived. Captain Edgar Edwards thought it too fantastic and his working theory was that after strange little Chloe viciously killed her mother and siblings, she had tried to burn down the house in order to conceal evidence. Dr. Paul DeRiver, LAPD MD and quasi-psychiatrist who later figured in an attempt to catch a Black Dahlia subject, and who also later authored the book The Sexual Criminal, interviewed Chloe and, with a flair for the dramatic, stated her to be the coolest blooded individual that he had ever met and hinted at an Electra complex. He and others tried to confuse her and trip her up in her story, but were unable to. In fact, she realized what they were doing and told them it wasn't going to work and she wasn't going to change her story. This took considerable mental resources since it was then and now not uncommon at all for police to lie to suspects in order to scare them into telling the truth. For instance, telling them that they had evidence guaranteeing their guilt or a witness who told them they had heard some damning statement made by the suspect and will testify against them, all untrue but used to garner a confession. Whatever tactics they used in this regard, however, she did not change her story except for one thing that she later remembered. She had initially forgotten about the razor blade, and so she told them her mother had requested it and slashed her wrists. Somehow the wrist wounds were not readily apparent when the body was viewed at the crime scene, but the coroner absolutely confirmed them, but not before Captain Edwards and the national press implicated Chloe as solely responsible for all four deaths. And yet in truth, Lolita died from a loss of blood as a result of slashing her wrists. The razor blade was found at the scene as well, so the police reluctantly accepted the facts. Part of the problem, too, was that Barton at first did not tell the police that his wife was mentally ill, describing her as normal. Family members have always had a hard time with the stigma of mental illness, and despite her problems, as far as we know, Lolita had previously not been violent. But since the police were focused on Chloe and would not release her into her father's custody, this husband and father, who loved his wife dearly, told them what his wife had been saying periodically up to the murders, including that she thought a book she read was written about her. He told them of bringing her to a psychiatrist to get help, and the family doctor stepped forward to confirm the delusional statements made by Lolita to him. Later friends and neighbors who knew her said she was fixated on death, but like Barton, and the doctors, they had not taken her very seriously. Even the psychiatrist who examined Lolita told Barton that there was nothing wrong with his wife that could not be cured. An overly optimistic view made many times over in other cases decided with recommendations by a profession that prided itself on having a remarkable ability to know whether a criminal would reoffend or not leading to untold numbers of cunning and sadistic criminals being released from psychiatric institutions only to reoffend again. Although Deputy Chief Cross declared that he was informed that one physician pronounced her a definite mental case and advised on psychiatric treatment. Unfortunately, we'll never know if Lolita could have been cured of her delusions because clearly the family had not the financial means to get Lolita treatment or committed to a private facility when state care was not authorized. Barton, like so many others who have heard bizarre and concerning statements made by an unwell loved one, only to otherwise see and hear them functioning normally, probably was just hoping his wife's problems would go away especially since Lolita herself 
had said she felt better after talking to their doctor, and her only real diagnosis had been that she was anemic, for which she was receiving shots. The stories of the murders and suicide were written up in the papers and even Time magazine. Chloe was given to live with relatives as the case was sorted out prior to her hearing in juvenile court. The funeral was held with white coffins at Woodlawn Cemetery, Santa Monica. Chloe was kept from the funeral as it was thought it would be detrimental for her mental health and healing. Barton needed assistance from friends and relatives to get through it himself. One suspected, always suspected, may have applied to Chloe, and with the rise of horror movies featuring murderous children, as well as a number of real cases, modern writers have not been easy on her. In fairness, she just didn't seem upset enough following the murders, and she was kind of a character really more like a cynical teenager in some respects than an 11-year-old. A number of imaginative scenarios of guilt are possible if we put our dark minds to the sole survivor and alternative events that may have happened within 1211 West 58th Place, a house still there by the way, but so remodeled and added onto as to be nearly unrecognizable. However, a full picture of Chloe's guilt or innocence cannot be attempted without hearing the results of her legal hearing in regards to the evidence. The story given once more by her father on the witness stand and testimonials made on her behalf by people much closer to the situation and who might well have been horrified by Chloe's participation in the murder house, and yet they were, with nothing to gain themselves, willing to testify in support of Chloe's character. Here follows the report published on April 25, 1940 by the Los Angeles Times, approximately three weeks after the murders. Chloe Davis, released in mass murder is the title, and it says, Father regains child, but she will remain ward of juvenile court. Chloe Davis is going home. For Superior Judge W. Turney Fox yesterday decided the place for the 11-year-old girl, whose two younger sisters and baby brother were battered to death by their crazed mother, is with her father. But because of the emotional and mental shock from which she has not yet recovered, the jurist made her a ward of the juvenile court so that she may be kept under observation. Thus officially was written the last chapter in the tragic story of the mass murder April 4th when Chloe's mother ran amuck in their home at 1211 West 58th Place, killed her three youngest children with a hammer, and then committed suicide by slashing her wrists. Victims of the tragedy were Mrs. Lolita Davis, Daphne 10, Deborah 7, and Marquis 4. Judge Fox made his order following a hearing at which principals and court attaches wept openly, wherein the girl retold her eyewitness story of her mother's murderous frenzy. Barton Davis, father of the little girl, sobbed his gratitude to Judge Fox on hearing the order. I thank you for being so nice to me, he said, faltering. I want to do everything I can for Chloe. The girl's father told how his wife thought herself possessed of a strange power and how she believed demons were coming to torture her children. She was possessed of the idea she had a power and that she had used this power to kill my sister's little girl, Patty, who died, he told Judge Fox. The idea of having a power, he said, apparently came from his frequent reference to her ability to always cure one of his headaches by rubbing his forehead. Clasping and unclasping his hands in agitation, his voice trembling, the father said he tried to talk his wife out of her notions and took her to a doctor for observation. Periodically, she would bring something up about these demons, he said. I asked her if she hadn't gotten it out of her system, and she said, No, Daddy, you are going to see. She made me promise not to tell anyone. On one occasion, he said his wife had been reading about a woman who apparently killed herself by inhaling carbon monoxide 
and she asked him if I loved her enough to go with her, as then they couldn't get me either. Another time, Davis declared his wife asked him where she could obtain chloroform. On the day of the tragedy, he said Mrs. Davis slept late and was not up when he left home. She had been awake in the night smoking innumerable cigarettes in the living room, he said. Chloe, who calmly played with the pleats in her bright plaid skirt and the red ribbons tied to the ends of her long braids as her father told her his story, lost her composure when asked to testify. Judge Fox, gaining her confidence by telling her he has a little girl of his own, drew from her the following story. When I woke up that morning, I heard some screaming. At this point, she burst into tears and pillowed her head on her father's shoulder. It was several minutes before she could resume. I'm not sure who it was, she continued, but I think it was Daphne. I got up to see what the noise was all about. I went into the hall and started wrestling with Mama for the hammer. I got hold of the hammer and she hit me then hit me again and made a bump. Again, her father comforted her. Finally, I got the hammer away, and she went to the cupboard and took out some matches and tried to set my hair on fire, she resumed. She said she had killed Daphne and Patty and told me about that power and said people were after her. She said she had finished them, the children. Those were the words she used. They were in some other room, asked Judge Fox. Yes. About the matches, did she light them? Yes. And she tried to set fire to you? How did you keep her from doing it? I kept watching the matches and dodging around her. Did she tell you to put your little brother out of his misery? Later she did. Do you recall what she said? I know she told me to put him out of his misery. Did you do anything about it? Chloe nodded her head in the affirmative. What? inquired Judge Fox. I put him out of his misery, she whispered. I hit him on the head with the hammer. About how many times? Three. Did you hit your mother at all? I hit my mother, but I don't know exactly how many times. She asked you to do that? Yes. The girl said under further questioning that she was frightened and shocked and almost scared to death. Other questions brought out that she had hit her brother with the handle of the hammer. Attorney Mitchell Moydell, representing Davis, then called four character witnesses who testified Chloe always was a model child and enjoyed the trust and respect of her neighbors and playmates. Miss Elsie Cooper, Chloe's sixth grade teacher, said, She is one of the finest children I have ever had in my classroom. She is studious, responsive, industrious, and socially minded. She was elected by other girls as their team captain for physical activities. Miss Jessica King, children's librarian at the John Muir branch of the public library, said Chloe frequently called there with her mother and that she always appeared normal and well-behaved. Two neighbors of the Davis family, Mrs. Margaret Travis, 1222 West 58th Place, and Mrs. Stacy Solinsky, 1207 West 58th Place, said Chloe appeared a model child. Mrs. Stolinsky said she always referred to her mother as Mommy Dear. Dr. Samuel Marcus, psychiatrist who examined the little girl, told the court, it appears Chloe reacted in a strange and unusual manner due to shock but there is nothing to indicate that she is not normal. Dr. Marcus said that it was apparent Mrs. Davis was insane and that her thoughts of her so-called power to heal had suddenly diverted into a desire to kill. In reviewing the evidence, Judge Fox commented, The courts accepts the findings of the coroner's jury that the minor, Chloe, is not responsible for the death of either her mother or brother that she was under the complete domination of her mother and therefore not responsible for any acts she may have committed. Very competent clinical and psychological studies definitely indicate she has no abnormality, either physical or mental. 
Judge Fox's order provided that Chloe live with her father in the home of relatives, subject to supervision by the probation department. She was given access to clinical facilities at Juvenile Hall. For the last two weeks, Chloe has been under the supervision of juvenile authorities while living with relatives pending Judge Fox's formal ruling. End of article. For many years, little was known about Chloe in her later life. She and Barton had left Los Angeles and moved to the Midwest, where Barton and his late wife were from. Barton died in 1956 in Cincinnati, Ohio, aged 57. He remarried Lucille Davis and had no more children. Chloe died in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1987, aged 58. She married three times and had children. The interesting thing was that she changed her name, and who can blame her for that? I'm sure that most people who met her in later years had no idea about her childhood tragedy. In Indianapolis, as Bonnie Luton, she became an accomplished artist, appearing in many shows and winning prizes throughout the years. On May 9, 1965, for instance, she was shown in the papers as one of the artists whose work would appear at the Talbot Street Art Fair. She was an active musician and an interior designer for Stuart Carey. Here's a July 2nd, 1963 ad which reads, Say, do you know what Stuart Carey's color coordinator Bonnie Luton just did for me? She planned a perfect color contrast between this Benjamin Moore paint and this new wallpaper that's going in our breakfast nook. She can blend and match colors too. See Bonnie Luton at Stuart Carey, 53rd and Keystone. On December 30th, 1985, Bonnie was featured in an article called Her Skill Gives Her an Edge in Craft of Beveling about her own shop called The Bevelry and work restoring beveled glass for vintage and antique clocks. The article states, she works on clocks to the sound of classical music. I always work to classical music, she says. I'm an amateur musician. She plays violin in two orchestras and three quartets. But she emphasizes that she's an amateur. We play for the love of it. And the music just kind of soaks in as she works. Glass has always interested me, continues the mother of grown children. In college, she majored in chemistry and zoology. After the children were in school, she took fine art classes and a course in beveling glass. Then I bought the machinery and opened the doors. That's when she got her real education, a well-honed degree in broken glass, stone wheels, rough hands, and a tired back. The result is fine art. End of article. On March 6, 1987, the Indianapolis Star published her obituary. It reads, Bonnie D. Luton, 58, Indianapolis, died Thursday in her home. Services will be at 2 p.m. Monday in Flanner and Buchanan Broad Ripple Mortuary with calling from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m., Saturday and Sunday. She owned and operated the Bevelry, a beveled glass studio for seven years. She also was an accomplished artist, violinist, and fencer. She was a member of All Souls Unitarian Church, Athenaeum Turner's Orchestra and Butler University Symphony. Born in Los Angeles, she lived here 28 years. Memorial contributions may be made to the Memorial Garden Fund at the church. Survivors, husband Philip L. Blumenthal Jr., sons Gary A. Metheny, Todd G., and John M. Dietz. End. On March 7, 1987, the Indianapolis News published a smaller obituary. There is little info about her extended family online, except that she married Robert Louis Dietz in 1950, married Ross Vance Luton in 1962, and married Philip Lee Blumenthal in 1986, just a year before she died. All her former husbands outlived her. 
Her son's March 16, 1993 obituary from Cincinnati, Ohio states, Gary Metheny, beloved son of Robert L. Dietz and the late Bonnie Dietz, brother of Todd and Mark Dietz and Linda Beth Pruitt, died on March 12, 1993. End. If I take anything away from these few later facts of her life, Chloe Bonnie was bursting with creativity and talent, just as one might have expected, and she created a life for herself that probably distanced itself as completely as possible from what her child self went through in April 1940. Her mind was soothed by and ever lifted by fine music, playing the violin in many orchestra concerts and listening to classical music in her shop. I'm sure the physicality of fencing was fun and perhaps a release from tension as well. I was taught fencing in my acting school, PCPA in Santa Maria, California, and it is a combat sport requiring strength, agility, discipline, and lightning fast moves. According to online sources, here are a couple of her paintings, and they are filled with impressionistic bright colors. It's hard to imagine, though, if she could have created similar paintings in red and not have been reminded of what happened. In our next segment, we'll take a close look at all the press photos I found over the years and what was being said about Chloe in the captions during the unfortunate and immediate rush to judgment. Beyond that, we'll discuss a strange connection to the Alienist TV series, and we'll look for any particular stressors beyond derangement that may have influenced Lolita Davis to murder three of her children and commit suicide. Finally, in our last segment, we'll hear a published defense of Chloe by a contemporary psychiatrist who provided an explanation as to her actions, state of mind, and relationship with her mother at the time of the murders. No doubt some listeners are ready to blast Chloe and proclaim that they never would have obeyed their mothers at 11 years of age to participate in violence. But all I can ask is that you don't rush to judgment before hearing the psychiatrist's opinions on the matter. Plus, you might do well to remember the Stanford prison experiment. However, if it still makes no difference what he or anyone else thinks, I can only hope that written responses be thoughtful and helpful. You might also want to see the rest of the photos as well, which in turn, depending on the viewer, may be seen as either favorable or unfavorable in regards to both Chloe and her father, though he was never under any suspicion for anything. As always, all rights, should they exist, to all photos and covers I've provided are owned by the copyright holders and are used here under the Fair Use Act. Thank you for listening to part one. A like is appreciated in that it helps others who may be interested in finding this material. And please see our next two segments on Chloe Davis. I will mention that I have not spoken with any members of her family, and if they would like to add something about her or a memory, I'm sure we would all appreciate it very much. And. If you have challenging mental health issues and may be contemplating harming yourself or others, please talk to your doctor. There are also a variety of online sources available, as well as your local suicide prevention hotline. Thank you.